Uh, tonight we start a new series. Shh. Y'all are crazy. Do y'all have a good weekend? Yeah. Good. I uh, I went to. Shh. Let's focus. I went uh, I went farming this weekend. I went to uh, what 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 should be called Arkansas. Uh, I went to farm. I went to farm some rice. Wonderful. Okay. Shh. Y'all, let's listen up, please, please. Thank you. All right. So. Shh. Okay, we are starting a new series, and um, you'll notice that last week we weren't here, um, but we're back, and we're doing a three-week series called Own It. Can everybody say Own It? Own It! Wonderful, okay, and so we're going to be talking for the next three weeks about how you own your faith, how about own, own your Bible, and own your worship. All right, uh, y'all list that, list. oh gosh. Okay, so hands up if you grew up, or if you're still going to, going to camps. Do y'all do camps, like in the summer and stuff, yeah? They're like camps. Okay, camps were my jam. Like, cam- wow, camps were the things that I did. Camps were the things that I loved to do. Every shh, every summer, I had to go um, to these camps. And I lived on the coast, and, and all of our camps were on the coast because we got to go surfing and we got to hear about Jesus. And I thought, well, this was great. But every time that I went to these camps, I was kind of like spoon-fed like the gospel. I was spoon-fed like Bible stories, spoon-fed scripture because. When I wasn't at camp, I really didn't do much maintaining on my faith. You see, because I didn't have a youth group growing up. Everybody says, oh, oh. Derek went to a small church that had 30 people every Sunday. Oh and God. so the youth group was me and my two sisters. Woo! Yeah. So I never had a youth group in middle or high school. And so I, I got to hang out with my family. That was awesome. It was great. But... Camps were the time whenever I got to get together with other young people from across the country. Ireland's pretty small, but so we got to get together and we got to talk about our faith, which was something new to me because I did not have a youth group. And it's part of the reason why I'm in youth ministry is because I want young people, I want you guys to experience some of the stuff that I maybe didn't get to experience because it's really, really important. But I relied heavily on others for my faith development. Because I wasn't doing any of this maintaining stuff for myself. I was waiting to go to July. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to camp. I'm going to get my Jesus on. I'm going to get my worship on. It's going to be... That's theologically incorrect. But anyway. um, when When it came to taking ownership of my faith, I left it up to others. I left it up to the camp leaders. And once that week was done, when I went back to my family, I went back to my everyday life, hey, it was fine because I wasn't at camp. I was going to wait until the next year. And see, whenever something challenging came along, whenever something hard in my life came up, you see, I, well, I walked on a road. Well, no, this was meant to symbolize running. But I, I would run away from God. Shh. I would run away from God when something difficult came. Rather, shh. Guys, let's listen, please. I would run away from God rather than run to God. Rather than clinging to him, I was trying to get away as fast as I could because I had no groundwork, I had no foundational faith that I had done myself. Tonight, I want us to look at a guy um, called Daniel. Everybody say Daniel. 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 We're going to look at a guy called Daniel. Daniel. All right. Okay. And Daniel, um, so in this book, there was a king, and his name was Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody say Nebuchadnezzar. 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 Yeah, it's an awesome name. Um, It's not really. But anyway, there was this king in the book of Daniel, and he had just come and he had taken over Jerusalem. He had taken over Jerusalem. Where had he taken over? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yes, he did. And he came in and he decided that he needed some of the most elite people in the nation. He needed some of the most handsome, some of the prettiest, some of the most well-spoken people. Girls in the front row. Shh. Hey. He needed some of the most elite people in all of the land. And guess who was one of them? Daniel. Daniel. Yes. Daniel was one of them. And so he summons Daniel and all of the other elites from the nation to come and to be part of his new kingdom that he's building because he wants to come and teach um, he wants to come and teach the Babylonians um, different stuff, I guess. But 
when Daniel got to be part of the elite club, the king was like, hey, Daniel, you can partake of some of the wine that I've got, like some of the good food that I've got. Like, this is, this is going to be for me, but it's also going to be for the elite crew. And Daniel was kind of like, mm, no, I'm not really about that whole wine stuff. I'm not really about all of that food because it's not, I don't really believe, and it, like, it, it kind of clashes with what um, I believe. Everybody else was doing it. But Daniel actually decided, well, hey, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to stand for my faith. I'm going to stand for what I believe in. If you go through the book a little bit, you'll see like Nebuchadnezzar starts to have these crazy dreams. Does anybody have any crazy dreams? Yeah? You all crazy dreams? Okay. When I was younger, I used to have these dreams, and the weirdest one was like about a large chicken. And the large chicken... I could never run away from the large chicken. The large chicken was in pursuit of me. And anyway, I would love somebody to interpret the dream of the large chicken. But Nebuchadnezzar was having these weird dreams, probably not about chickens, but he needed somebody to interpret these dreams. And now, who do you think interpreted the dreams? Daniel. Daniel. Yes, Daniel interpreted the dreams. God gave him, shh, God gave him a vision and God was going to, God told Daniel, it's like, hey, these are what the dreams are about. I want you to go and tell who? King? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, wonderful. And so Nebuchadnezzar loved this. This is really, really, really good. And so um, he found favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. But going forward a couple of um, chapters later, oh, I don't know what that picture's about. Oh, that was about clinging. Oh, yeah, that was too late. Okay. Anyway, we go to this. And do you remember what happens with Daniel later in the story? Daniel and the lion's den because okay so there was King Nebuchadnezzar and then a couple of sh couple of chapters later is this guy King it begins with D does anybody know Darius Darius yeah well done there was this king sh there was this king called Darius and he made this law because Daniel was actually pretty favored Daniel was doing all of the right things and people liked Daniel apart from the other elites. They didn't really like Daniel anymore because they'd seen about how much favor that he was getting. And so they were like, mm, we, need to, we need to come up with something in order to get Daniel like, taken out of the scene a little bit. So they convinced Darius. They were like, hey, Darius, um, if, what about if, girls, like, Darius, what about um, if you make this like, kind of law that if somebody goes to their god within the next like, 30 days, then the result is going to be the lion's den. And so Darius is like, sure, signs it. Then what do you think Daniel goes and does? Daniel spends time with God. Whenever you read Daniel, you see that Daniel went to his room, he got on his knees, he prayed to God daily. He had a groundwork. He put in a foundational part of his faith. And so what happens? Who, who finds him? The other elites, okay? The other elites find him, and who do they go and tell? King? Darius. They go and tell King Darius, and they're like... Yes, Darius. They go and tell King Darius, and then Daniel gets thrown in to the lion's den. But Daniel still remained faithful throughout the whole process. Daniel didn't run away from God like I was so tended to do on my faith journey. Like if something was, like say something like this, um, Daniel, um, if you continue to talk to your God, to pray to your God, uh, the result is going to be uh, lions. You're going to wake up and there's going to be many, many lions. Um, I'm never going to think, wow, yes, God, incredible. Uh, but Daniel, throughout this whole thing, clings to God. He doesn't walk away from him. He clings. He owns his faith. You see, he went and put in time alone with God. He didn't just wait around until like Babylonian camp or like camp in Jerusalem. Like he went off to himself in his room to spend time alone with God. He put in the groundwork to build a foundation. So you're like, all right, cool, Derek, that's awesome. Daniel's great. King Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, yada, yada, yada. What does this mean for me as a seventh grader, eighth, ninth grader? Well, I want to give you some practical takeaways um, tonight about, how, well, how do I own my faith? What does that look like for me in Brentwood, Tennessee in 2016? Okay, the, the first thing, um, you need time, and, and this is what I call, you need time in your prayer closet. No, wait. I'm going to explain. It's not like a literal closet in your room that has got prayer written above it. Like, you're not going to go home tonight and be like, yo, dad, I need you to build me a closet because Derek said I need to pray in the closet. It needs to happen. I'm not saying that. You, you, need, you need time in your prayer closet. And I'm not talking just about a structural thing. I'm talking about whatever that looks like for you. 
Whenever, uh, whenever I was like 16 and 17, whenever I decided to take ownership of my faith, that's when I decided, that's when I seen growth. But my, um, my prayer closet was actually mowing the yard. It's kind of weird. But that was the time whenever I got away from anybody else. I had my um, headphones in and I was listening to music and I would listen to worship music and that was my prayer closet. Your prayer closet could look completely different. You need to find that place where you, by yourself, now I'm not talking about you and your friends, I'm talking about you and yourself. For Daniel, that was in his room by himself in silence and quietness with God. What does your prayer closet look like? I have no idea. For me, it was pushing a lawnmower, not one of these sit-on things, pushing a lawnmower. That's whenever I spent time with God. Another time was whenever I had my guitar. And I was sitting and I was just singing guitar, singing guitar, wow. I was just singing songs with my guitar, just making a bunch of noise. But for me, that was my prayer closet. Okay, so what do you need to do? You need to go find your what? Prayer, prayer closet. closet. Not a structural thing, but whatever that looks like for you. You need to create a rhythm. This is the second thing. You need to create a rhythm of spending time with God. Not just once a year, not just, hey, every Sunday night, because you know what? It's cool that you all have a youth group. This is great. I love this. But you cannot just wait until, oh, I'm just going to wait until Wednesday, or hey, I'm just going to wait until Sunday morning or Sunday night. You need to create a rhythm of doing this daily. Daily go into your prayer closet to spend time alone with God, because the reality is this. You will never experience growth until you feed yourself. Never experience growth until you feed yourself. It's great when we go to church and we go to youth group and we hear the word of the Lord and it's awesome, but you're gonna experience real and true growth whenever you go to God by yourself and hey, spend some time. You'll never experience growth until you feed yourself. The next one is, read this book. You know, whenever um, um, I grew up, I had to, I just, to this day actually, I. I, reading is not one of my favorite things. I struggle reading. I don't know if that's anybody else. I struggle to read. Um, I'm a slow reader, real, real slow. And so whenever I was given my Bible, um, and my and my um, my grandmother was like, "Hey, Derek, I'd love you to read this." I th my instant reaction was no. Um, <laughs> but seriously, I'm gonna talk. Sh I'm gonna talk about this more next week because you're like you may be like me. Okay, it's a it's a big book. Where on earth do I turn to? Like. I have no idea where I turn to in this book. Well, we're going to talk about that next week, giving you some practical places on where to start and what to do with it, because this book is life-giving. Okay, so the first one is spend time in your what? Prayer, Prayer closet. closet. The second time is that you need to create a rhythm. Create a rhythm. And the third time is you need to read. This book. You need to write this book. Write this book? Wow. Read this book or the Bible. We're going to talk about that next week. The fourth thing, the fourth thing, everybody say the fourth thing. The fourth thing. The fourth thing is I challenge you to have faith conversations. And everybody was like, ooh, no, that's out of my comfort zone. Yes, I challenge you, number four, to have faith conversations. Because you know what? The reality is like this. We can talk all day about silly stuff. We can talk all day um, about our uh, Titans, which, oh, that's unfortunate. Um, but they lost today again. Um, but we can talk all day. We can talk all day about different stuff. But when it comes to our faith, sometimes we're like, oh, Jesus, great, awesome. Um, but I challenge you tomorrow around your lunch table at school to talk about your faith. Why not? Why not? If you believe in this guy called Jesus, then wh why, why do we find it so difficult to talk about him? So I challenge you, number four, to begin to have faith conversations. To talk to your friends, shh, to talk to your friends about your struggles. To talk to those closest to you about things that are going on in your life that you need some help with. And so, those are the four things. We're going to do it again. The, the first thing is you need to spend time in your... You need to create a... You need to read the... Uh huh. And then the last one is you need to have faith... Conversations. Conversations. Awesome. Coming here to church and coming to youth group is fantastic. It's needed. You need time in community, but you also need time by yourself. You need time um, to feed yourself. You need time um, to spend time with God and be like, hey God, what have you got for me? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that next week, about how do we own our Bible. Um, but tonight, that's how we own our faith or begin to. 
I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to have um, a time of worship. Um, so, y'all can stand if you'd like and grab a hand.